Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. On February 11th, 2024, we will celebrate the transfiguration of our Lord. And we will use these texts, 2 Kings 2, 1 through 12, Psalm 50, 1 through 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6, and Mark 9, verses 2 through 9, which coincidentally is the story of the transfiguration of our Lord. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so that text falls on this Sunday. So every year we get the synoptic, whatever the, the gospel du jour is, we get that version of the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And they all have their distinctive elements. And they all leave everybody a little confused. Like, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now what? <laughs> now what? What do you do with that kind of awe? Um, yeah, I'm going to expose you and and say <laughs> what you said before we started recording, which was, yeah. I've been doing this for 15 years and I still don't under understand what the transfiguration means. <laughs> so yeah. I think that that is, is that a, a word of comfort for all the teachers out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, we can compound it. I've been teaching the Synoptic Gospels for even longer and I still am kind of like... The story, this, the story changes at this point, and it does, you know, but it's more than just a literary marker. I, I think it comes back to, I've, I might have said this in a previous year, I think it's a story that is meant to leave us more amazed than understanding, and maybe that's okay, and maybe a sermon can can do that too, that instead of explaining this, you try to not recreate, but at least kind of embody or somehow enflesh the, um, the peculiarity of it, but the but the peculiar beauty of it, not peculiar in the sense of like, this is weird, but there's something really attractive and enticing. And I think appropriately otherworldly about this, that we should just mm -hmm. kind of stand in awe. That's the best I can do. Let's, let's end the podcast and move on. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, what do you all think? I mean, how do you? No, I, I think, I think that's true. And it is a, I think it's an important, stance, if you will, when we think of the liturgical position of the transfiguration, and we were talking about this also before we, we were started recording, Joy mentioned this, of, and of the way in which it functions. Is it the end of Epiphany or the beginning of Lent or both? And so that, or, and so that the way in fix it functions as this sort of transitional story liturgically, is then really connected to what you were saying, Matt, in terms of of what do we do in this in between space? This you know on the cusp of Lent, but coming off of Epiphany, and how do we, what you know what what would a normal transition be, and how we couldn't really we we couldn't really imagine anything to mm -hmm. make that transition, and so how do we just sit in that sort of transitional liturgical space? And is there a way in which the preacher could point to those kinds of places of, of transition that bring us from where we were to where we're going, particularly not, not in general, but in our lives of faith where we're just kind of in awe and we, and we reflect on where we've been and we kind of know where we're going, but here we are in this middle space and, uh, and so I think that in and of itself can become a sermon, regardless mm -hmm. of what you say, about it, <laughs> rather than trying to explain the explain the tr transfiguration. I love that in the sense of uh, we've lost some of the mystery, uh, some of the enchantment, uh, some of the awe, uh, because we've spent so much time in our head. We've spent so much time with the principles. We spent so much time trying to get it right. Um, th there's something about um, watching a child try to uh, imitate uh, a, a, an adult's activity that they're in awe of, um, uh, whether that is uh, uh a, a toy car or playing around in the kitchen or um, trying to, you know, uh, uh, play music or, or you know, uh, 
be on the drums, before they actually know what they're doing, they are drawn to uh, imitate it because they are in awe of what they've seen. And it's not perfect and and we're okay with that. We respond to a child's imitation, not by saying, what are you doing with those sticks? You can't play the drums. Or why are you at the piano? Or put down those things. You're messing up my kitchen. You can't cook. We, we, we encourage that. And so I think la- allowing this text to recover that sense of awe, and, and the King's text will do this as well, uh, if we read it in such a way, uh, where we allow ourselves to recover this sense of uh, otherworldliness, of beyond our control, um, uh, just outside the realm of what we can wrap our gray matter around. And that's what makes it good. That's what makes it great. It's captured our attention. I don't know what the heck to do with it, but I want to hang yeah. around <laughs> it for a little bit longer. I think that would be a right. worthwhile right. sermon. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a difference between like reading this passage as a kind of a component of the synoptic gospels and, and preaching it, and especially preaching it on this Sunday, like I think we're, we're getting at. Um, yeah. You seen the TV commercials? Uh, he gets us. Some Christian yeah. group that had these yeah. TV commercials about how Jesus gets us. Yeah. I've been known to yell back at the TV like that doesn't mean that we get him necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. He might. Uh, he might have that insight. I, I love what David Schnauzer Jacobson did in terms of tying this to baptism and the cross. Yeah. I also would want to expand that as these revelatory moments. I, I would want to connect baptism to the testing in the wilderness. I want to connect crucifixion and resurrection. I want to connect transfiguration to what comes before, which is the first prediction of his death and the first Mm -hmm. clear statement, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That these these are these three big revelatory moments or collections, but they also all need each other, I think, to kind of flesh out what's going on. And so there's a way in which maybe the transfiguration isn't supposed to make sense until we've um, tried to reckon with cross and resurrection as well. Yes. Well, yes. And I think, uh, you know, one verse that I would lift up is verse six, right? He did not want know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, he's like, yeah, this is a good idea. I'll, I'll make tents and y'all hang out for, let's all hang out for a while because he didn't know what to say. And there it is. He did not know what to say. And so we're not, you know, as in our ruminations about this, we're not just making that up. It's in the text. We don't know what to say. What do we say? And for they were terrified. And so it draws on the, the entirety of the, of the disciples fear, right. And awe. Mm -hmm. I, I also going back to what you were just saying, Matt, I, I would almost want to add a verse, just one, and that is verse 10. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning mm. what this rising from the dead could mean. Could mean. And, uh, and so, uh, so there's in part that connection, right, that you're making, Matt, between the baptism and the testing in the wilderness and the crucifixion, that, that you know, what does this rising from the dead mean? None of that's going to happen without Jesus' ministry and without the crucifixion. And so it, I think it's an homiletical invitation, too, mm-hmm. to, uh, to connect to connect this revelatory moment with uh, the awesomeness of the rising of the dead and in the, in the resurrection, and so it it points beautifully to, of course, uh, Lent and Easter. Uh, uh, but um, that I think it maybe adding that verse too would help to mm-hmm. engage people in that in this thoughtfulness about it rather than answers about it. That's really helpful. It makes you wish they had told Mary, Mary, and Salome, mm. who right, who have a similar experience with the resurrection itself, because yeah. they apparently yeah. had not been clued in about the transfiguration. Right. Right? There's a right. sense in which all the disciples are operating out of partial knowledge, knowledge. Yeah. partial awareness. That's good. Yeah. That's good, Matt. Yeah, 
Yeah. I, I, if, if we're going to mention these places, yeah. If we're going to mention these places, uh, I want, I want to offer a caution. Um, there are times when our looking for the right thing to do because we've heard a text uh, has brought us to criticizing um, uh, Peter for having this great project without paying attention to verse 6 as you lifted up for us, uh, Caroline. But he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say. And sometimes we might need to acknowledge that some of the things that we eagerly do in the name of God or plan in the name of God or propose in the name of God, we might need to be honest, as Matt was, to say, we really don't know what we're talking about. And that not be for criticizing Peter, but that being for saying, this has been such an incredible moment. Something, there has to be a response to it. But the truth is, my first idea might not be the right idea. And, and that my becomes a collective. Building this big church, uh, planning this big event, doing this big thing, as if we don't have the hindsight that um, Mary, Mary, and Salome didn't have. Um, you know, maybe that's not the right. People have been wounded by some of these big ministries. People have been wounded by some of these great projects. And if we would pay attention to what is known and not lose that and read that text as as much a warning and invitation than just a prescription of what to do or a critique of a failure. It also makes me think of asking, okay, what would you have done? <laughs> I mean, right? What would what would you're standing there on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. What what would you have said? What you, what would you have done? I mean, it just it that's the that's the other um, potential there as well. So yeah, that's helpful. Second I thought thing. Joy. I thought Joy was summarizing my Transfiguration sermon with verse six. Like, oh, that's <laughs> so what you'd say in the parking lot. Well, he didn't know what to say because he was he didn't terrified. know what to say. So <laughs> good, yeah. good was, shot. <laughs> Sorry. Caroline, you wanted to talk about Second Kings and Elijah's departure. Yeah, um, and and I I have to acknowledge I really really appreciate uh, Jason Bias's uh, commentary on on this in in so many places. Um, when I look at Second Kings uh, chapter two, one of the first things I always pay attention to are these places. Uh, uh, they are significant places in the history of Israel, in the journey of Israel, in um, the experience of Israel, as as Jason points out. They are significant places before Elisha and Elijah arrive. And um, the, the, the other thing that uh, I think is noteworthy, and it's noteworthy to me, uh, and I, I probably have mentioned this before, this was the text that I had to preach um, or it was the assigned lectionary, and I preached the lectionary uh, my first Sunday uh, at uh, a new congregation following a pastor who had been well-respected and there for a long time. And I was like, there's no way that I can dare say, I want a double portion. Everything you think that's great about him, I'm going to be twice as good. It was like, oh gosh, there's no way. And a colleague of mine, Mike Pascarello, reminded me Joy, it's not about you. It's about God. And that's exactly what I think is the significant thing about this text. Um, uh, Jason uh, says it like this. Scripture is saying the next generation will be just fine. And Several years ago, before I read Jason's commentary on it, the way that I took that text was to say, God will never be without a witness. The passing on of the mantle from one generation to the next will always allow for a witness to the awe-inspiring, 
I don't know what to do with this uh, proclamation of the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's, I think that's really helpful. And it also is maybe an overlooked aspect of the transfiguration that you have on this mountain, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, Peter, and the way in which that mantle is passed down, right, of being a witness for God, who God is and how God is and God's activity. And mm -hmm. so uh, and so maybe that's one aspect of the transfiguration, right, is then we come along, imagine ourselves on that mountain as well. And we yes. are, we're, we're the next generation, right, of, of these witnesses. And so, uh, and and so it it's a uh, yeah I think it's also this opportunity to uh, to remind people that that they are uh, that they stand in that in that cloud of witnesses as well uh, mm -hmm. and and taking on that taking on that mantle and to what will they witness and what will they say and what will they do yeah like that. And highlighting, um, with that, highlighting another point that, that Jason makes, uh, rather than reading uh, an arrogance in um, uh, this, uh, uh, this point of Elijah not uh, responding uh, favorably to Elisha following him, uh, but instead this Jewish practice of, if you're going to take on this mantle, then you need to make sure that you're sure that you're sure that you know what you're getting into, because this isn't going to be easy. Um, this isn't, you know, all pie in the sky, a glory, glory. Uh, there's going to be struggle and there's going to be, we, you know, we'll talk about that as we get to the season of Lent. And uh, so this checking oneself, uh, it's not easy to say, yes, I will be this witness. And we need to also be attentive to that. Psalm 50? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> there's the connection. So maybe that's the that's the connection with the tents and the tabernacles. <laughs> no, I I'm went kidding. with not really. But. I went with verse five. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. That that acknowledgement uh again that excuse me, being faithful to God uh, in response to God um, will require sacrifice. It will not be easy. But all of this is for the sake of verse two, God shines forth. So that's the yes. connection I was making, you know, mm -hmm. and glowing and all of that. Uh, and <laughs> that uh, God shines forth. Um, and that it's about God. Uh, that, yeah. Mm-hmm. My thought about this was also, um, you know, the last three verses, at least in the in the lection, are about judging as well. Um, mm -hmm. And Rolf talks about this in the commentary uh, about how God is summoning creation to participate in this judgment. And I wonder, I don't think I have any final thoughts on this, but I wonder the transfiguration is also wrapped up in the revelation of Jesus, I think also as a judge, at least to take some of John's preaching, not a lot of it in Mark, but, and I'm not saying judge in the sense of the final judge, sending people to heaven or hell, but this idea of the one who, uh, who shines a light into shadowy places, you know, the one who exposes the, the shortcomings of the world and its systems and, um, Anyway, I don't know if some of that's part of it too, right? That it's not that judgment is not the absence of God's love. It's the way in which God's love transforms unjust places and systems. And again, the transfiguration doesn't really have that language, but I think it's so wrapped up, especially when Jesus has just announced that he's going to be, you know, executed. So mm -hmm. um, there's that. Anyway, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would make that my transfiguration sermon. Um but it's a reminder again of the otherness of God and the mm -hmm. the that the beauty of this, tr this God's transcendence also quickly minimizes 
<laughs> I should say maybe maximizes uh, the ways in which we fall short. But that would ruin the Transfiguration picnic or whatever you've got planned after the service. <laughs> you right. Wanna... Yes. We're coming up on Shrove Tuesday. Anyway. <clears throat> so what would your connection to Transfiguration be with the Second Corinthians text? <laughs> Are you talking to Joy? <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, I like the way you two pass that over like that. Well, uh, we've been talking about um, uh, the glory. We've been talking about uh, the um, uh, experiencing the mystery and the awe. So I'm going to be literal and say uh, it's an unveiling, which is the opposite of if yeah. the gospel is veiled. <laughs> uh, uh, just just that acknowledgement that. Uh, I, and, and again, I would turn to uh, David Fredrickson's uh, commentary, where he puts this uh, letter in its um, uh, in its historical context and its um, a literary context in terms of Paul is making an argument in the midst of talking about leaders within the body and those who have been. Um, uh, uh, to use words elsewhere, preaching another gospel. And so that calling out of other is not those outside of the community. It's those inside of the community um, that, that, that are not being faithful. And I think that if, if you're going to uh, read this uh, Second Corinthians text, that you definitely need to put it in the context that David Fredrickson reminds us in, that Paul is actually talking to those that are dividing the body. And that's what the criticism is. Yeah, David's commentary is great in that regard. I mean, he says it flat out in the beginning of his second paragraph. This is really difficult to understand. <laughs> this <passage>. Yes. <laughs> and indeed, the whole larger argument that Paul is making here. So, yeah, I think as a preacher, you need to read this and do a little bit of, of wading around in Second Corinthians. But I don't think you can preach that. I don't think you have time on a given Sunday morning to explain what in the world's going on in this part of <laughs> Second Corinthians. Mm -hmm. But that imagery, though, as well, let light shine out of darkness, God who has shown in our hearts, uh, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Just unpack that phrase a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Epiphany's the season of light, right? Or the season of, and Lent as well is woven into um, kind of the patterns of nature, at least in the Northern hemisphere of, of lengthening days. And mm -hmm. so it, 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 it does provide some interesting ways you can bring epiphany to a close and lead people into Lent as you talk about some of that really poignant symbolism. I was thinking that too, of the phrase, let light shine out of darkness and how, how, again, as a transition, a transitional Sunday, if you will, a reflection on it, a, reflect, a reflection on that epiphany promise. What light has has shown out of darkness over these last you know five Sundays or this in, in this time of epiphany? What light has shown out of darkness when and um, giving people a sense of 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 those moments of the way in which um, the the promise of God's glory is is ever present and and. And that that will be also true even going into a season of, of it, to some extent, darkness. Uh, oh, when we think yeah. about Lent and sort of darkness of that, um, of that season. And so, uh, so how, again, it really is an, in, such an interesting transitional Sunday of reflection on that and moving into what could be perceived as the, as the you know, of the darkness of going to the cross. 